Oh, you are recording. Perfect. Okay. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley. I'm with the Prince William Conservation Alliance, and uh, we're really excited to have Susan Watson uh, back with us. She did a, a presentation a while back with Salamanders. I'm sure some of you remember that. Um, but before I introduce her and we get started, I'm going to quickly share my screen um, and let you all know. First, we have a uh, fundraising uh, event. You can raffle. We have a raffle, so you can win this um, really spectacular rain barrel, and it's still up, um, and we'll be doing the, um, the raffle on um, May 1st. It says 11 a.m. that might change, but definitely May 1st. So there's still um, an opportunity to, to win and get tickets. And, oh, that's not what I meant to do. And additionally, um, we also, uh, we hold, we have several uh, up, interesting upcoming events, and um, you can find them on our calendar page. And next week, we have an event um, uh, thoroughfare with Frank Washington, and we'll be taking a look at uh, a piece of really important history here in Prince William and uh, what is happening there today and um, what we can do to um, to to support this community. So it would be um, it. It would be great to see you there as well. And all right, but now for the real reason why we're, we're all here, um, I did kind of go over the format a little bit with Julie, but just as a reminder, we'll we'll have our presentation first. But as uh, things go, um, if you have questions feel free to use the chat box. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll open it up to discussion and we'll go through the chat also um, for you to share your comments and questions with the, with the group. And um, so with that, I will introduce um, Susan Watson uh, is a wildlife information biologist at the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, and she's been at the agency since 2001. Uh, she primarily um, obtains and reviews wildlife data from um, the, the databases and mapping systems. She received a BS at wildlife, uh, in wildlife science from Virginia Tech and is an active officer in the um, the Virginia Herpetological Society and is on the board of the Friends of the Lower Atabomix River. Uh, and in her free time, her interests include artwork, hiking, gardening, and fishing. And we are so very grateful to have her with us tonight as we learn about the, the, the fascinating world of bats. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully it works again. There we go. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? Okay. So we're gonna talk about um, Virginia's bats and I'll start with um, just bats in general at first. Um, go ahead and move forward. Oops. One, two. Can't seem to get my slides to forward. Hang on a minute. There we go. <laughs> um, so bats is uh, the very word elicits emotional response for most people. So, so sometimes it's fear, things like Count Dracula, but also there's um, fascinating things and fun things that bats can be related to as well, such as things like Batman. And, and I um, also decided to show the symbol that Bacardi has used for over 100 years. Um, bats are actually very important for um, the making of rum. So um, they've been an important symbol for that as well. So there's some fun things that bats are associated with as well. Um, but uh, uh, in general, it, it's always fascination is probably the top emotion. Um, even if there's some fear, 
you you're very most people are very curious about them. Um, so let's talk about bats in general. Um, we've got uh, the taxonomy and the biology of bats. So they are mammals. They have fur. They bear live young, and they produce milk for the young. They're unique among mammals, though, because they actually um, are capable of sustained flight. Now we have flying squirrels, but they actually technically only glide. They're very good at it, but they glide. Uh, bats are the only mammals that actually fly. Uh, and they are in the order. They're not um, flying mice, so they're not in Rodentia. They are in the order Chiroptera. They're in their own order under mammals. And Chiroptera is a Latin word, comes from a Latin word that stands for hand wing. And you can see in the um, illustration here how that is that comes about. So that if you look at their wings, it's basically um, their version of their hands. You can see the, the thumb is labeled here, second finger, third finger, fourth finger, fifth finger, are these different parts of the wing, the bones are um, con uh, connected to that membrane. And you can even see um, the membrane from the wing and the, and the tail. We've got the knee bone here, and then the elbow bone on the top of the wing. So you can see how it's actually a hand wing that they use to, to fly. So when we talk about Chiroptera, there's two different types of bats throughout the world. We've got macro, mega Chiroptera and micro Chiroptera. Mega, of course, is large. And these are, um, in other parts of the world, we have large fruit eating bats like we see in the photo here. Um, mostly it's fruit and other plant parts are the diet of large mega chiroptera. And they don't use echo like location, like the smaller, the micro chiroptera. They have large eyes to help them see. And of course, they're not going after a diet that's very small and moves quickly. So they don't need the echo like location like the smaller bats do. And we'll talk more about that. Um, micro chiroptera are the examples like the bats we see in our area, Indiana bat and little brown bat in this photo. Um, of course, they're small in comparison. They um, mostly eat insects, but there are other adapted diets among micro chiroptera. And some of them, for instance, especially south of here may eat pollen and nectar, and um, as well as other small invertebrates or maybe even small invertebrates of the larger ones. Um, and they do use echolocation because they are after small prey, very small prey that moves very quickly and most of the time at night. So echo, they can see very well with their small eyes, but they also use echolocation. They need all the senses they can get for that type of prey and that night. Um, so the next one, a little bit more about global diversity. We have in the world, worldwide, there are 1,400 species, over 1,400 species. And these are the examples of the largest and smallest of those. Mega Chiroptera here, the largest is the giant golden crown flying fox. Um, that's found in the Philippines. It's a diet of fruit and leaves. The wingspan is five foot six inches, and they weigh up to about 2.6 pounds. So kind of like birds, they get pretty big, but they still weigh pretty light since they have to fly. Um, the smallest in the micro chiroptera, this is the bumblebee bat, also in Asia, mostly in Thailand and Myanmar. They eat insects and spiders. And the wingspan is only 6.7 inches. Um, the weight is under a tenth of an ounce. And total, total length, they're about one and a half to two inches from head to tail. So quite a difference in the species as far as sizes. And of course, there's lots of different um, species around the world, different colorations and body structure. Um, some of it depends on their diet and habitat. And, and so for diets, of course, we got different diets around the world, as we've mentioned already, insects and small invertebrates. 
um, small vertebrates for some of those larger microchiroptera species, fruit and other vegetation, nectar, cut, pollen, seeds, and yes, there are a few, I think it's actually three species that lap up blood. So we have three vampire bat species in Mexico and Central America. They don't make it into the United States. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. So ecological importance, they are very important um, throughout the world for pest control, pollination, and seed dispersal, as we've talked about with those different um, diets. Um, pest control, of course, a lot of those that eat insects and small invertebrates um, are important for pest control of many of the crops that we eat and use, as well as um, native vegetation. So they're, they're uh, an ecological balance even in, in nature. Um, so a lot of the pests will e even feed on native plants as well. But this is a good a chart of showing what bats do for people as far as crops that we're concerned with. Um, they actually not only will eat, one of the things we all learn is that they of course eat mosquitoes and some of the other biting insects. So that's good for pest control as well, um, things that may spread disease and cause us other discomfort, um, but also the pest control of the insects that um, eat and devour our crops. Um, so you can see here in the first category, what bats protect are things like beets, coffee, um, on down to corn and chocolate. Um, one of my favorite things, of course, is chocolate and uh, citrus fruits, rice, pecans, cotton, strawberries, all types of things and different nuts. And some of these things I've seen different charts of these in different categories. Um, chocolate is also, I think, has bats that either pollinate or spread the seeds of it as well. Um, and then we've got things that um, bats pollinate south of, uh, mostly south of here and south of the US, um, things like agave, bananas, avocados, coconuts. Um, and in fact, agave, certain species of agave are completely dependent on bats to pollinate and, and no other species, no other type of animal. Um, so another reference to alcoholic beverages is tequila is completely dependent on bats. <laughs> um, also, they spread seeds. So the things that eat the fruits and, and other things, other parts of the plant may eat the seeds and they disperse the seeds as they, um, of course, fly around and um, defecate the seeds. And that is a, a great vehicle of dispersal for this, um, the things in this category, the almonds, the cashews, papayas, figs, and so on. So they're very important to think about all these different things. And there's even more on this list of things that they do. Let's see, more benefits of bats um, include um, how we study them for different things. So here we get to talk about the vampire bat. This is one of the species here in the photo. And, and, and as far as medicine is concerned, but vampire bats are studied for their anti-clotting um, um, that they have in their saliva that they use. Uh, so bat, vampire bats, um, not like the vampires you see in movies and TV, they don't suck blood and they don't turn you into a vampire, but <laughs> they instead um, just, and usually they go after um, cattle or large animals that are sleeping on the landscape. And, and they basically will just get on the animal at night when they're sleeping and have a look wherever they are on the animal, make a little cut with their teeth. And there's something in their saliva that's anticoagulant or anti-clotting, so the blood flows and they just lap it. They don't suck it all out. <laughs> and it's basically just the irritant, I think more than anything. They do. The only thing there is, um, there's been a few cases where they may um, pass a disease here and there, but it's there's no big outbreaks of any that I've heard. Um, that's just a rare thing. Um, but they do actually for medicine look at the anti-clotting um, properties that they have for medicines for strike victims. So they're very important in um, medical studies. Um, technology studies as well. Technology looks at bats and in the illustration here talking about echolocation. Um, echolocation is studied um, for, by people for as well as flight, their flight abilities and their echolocation, both have been used for sonar, 
for airplane maneuverability and navigation technology. So very important things there that have developed because of our studies of bats and the things that they can do. And echolocation, I'll go into that a little bit in case you're not real familiar. Um, it's a way that they navigate to find their food and, and, and to navigate in the dark. They emit a high frequency, mostly from their mouth. Sometimes it's from their nose a little bit. Um, high frequency pulse that travels out and bounces off of objects. And this helps when it comes back to them, they have very sensitive ears and it, that bounce back to them tells them what um, determines what the size of the object is, where the distance of it and what direction it's heading. So this is very helpful, like I said, with, especially when they're going after small insects or small invertebrates and they're actually chasing, it's actually moving. And it's usually a lot of times it's in the woods or some other um, objects are around. So very useful to um, have and just, just a great ability that we use, like I said, for study and technology. Also fertilization is another thing. Um, Bat guano, which is basically bat droppings, are actually highly sought after for fertilizer. It's, it's a, um, known to be extremely powerful as a fertilizer. So it's, there's an economic and agricultural reward there. So um, in some places where you have large colonies of bats at caves, there are certain sites like that with large colonies of bats where guano is actually collected for that reason. So threats to bats worldwide, um, like with most wildlife, unfortunately, habitat destruction and habitat disturbance is one of the top um, reasons that we have had threats to bats. Um, also, slow ge gestation period. Um, most bats only have, um, well, many, many bats, probably most bats only have one pup per female, and they may not have one every year. So that slow reproduction makes it harder for them to keep going if there's um, a threat to them. Um, white nose syndrome is a big one in the United States as well as in Southern Canada now. Um, that is something that showed up in 2006 in New York. Um, I'll talk about that one a little bit more um, as we get to the specific Virginia threats. There's um, also hunting and persecution. That's a little more in other countries where they actually are, where they actually are hunted often for sport or for meat, and um, not so much in the U.S. The uh, wind turbine energy is another threat, unfortunately. Um, like with birds, we've heard also bats can be killed by the blades. Um, there are solutions that have been um, practiced studied and practiced to try to mitigate that. And honestly, with that being a renewable energy, the, the benefit of it outweighs the impact we're having on bats. And like I said, we're doing things to decrease the impact as much as possible. And I'll talk about that one a little more in a minute too. Um, and then there's the harmful myths or proliferation of myths. And unfortunately, um, the usual myths that we know of on, on top of that, in the past year or so, we've had the unfortunate myth of um, the COVID-19 virus that has um, brought more bad news to bats. Um, unfortunately, that, that goes back to the persecution. We've gotten um, heard stories in other countries where people are trying to kill bats because they think they're spreading COVID-19. Well, COVID-19, you know, of course, they, they think that the coronavirus that causes it came from bats. But it's not that bats gave it to us, it's what we were doing to the environment and with the bats that we shouldn't have been doing. So um, really it's not, killing the bats is not gonna make COVID-19 go, go away. Um, so those are some of the threats worldwide. Oh, and so this is, now we're gonna go down more to Virginia and this is gonna prompt me to tell Ashley that this may, this is our poll um, how many bat species are in Virginia? So we can start focusing on those. Thanks, Ashley. I, um, 
So it says that I'm logged in from another device and my polling okay. session is inactive. So we're not going to have a poll today. Okay. We're going to just <laughs> in your mind, guess okay. how many okay. bat species there are. Oh. Sorry about that. Hello. You could put the answers in the chat. Yeah. Oh, wait, it popped up. There it is. Yeah, it's, it's showing. So can people click on that? Done. Okay. I guess I can do my. Okay, everybody gets the range. <laughs> Now, Ashley, are you able? To, oh, okay, there it is. Oh, okay. So the correct answer was not the most popular answer. <laughs> and I'm gonna see if I can get back to the next slide. Oops. There we go. 17 species was the correct answer. So those of you that guessed that, that's the right answer. <laughs> I didn't put all of them on the pictures here. Um, this was just a collage. So there are 17 native species of bats recorded in Virginia. Some are more common than, than others, of course. And so first we'll meet our first, our official state bat of Virginia is the Virginia big-eared bat. And that species is a federally endangered, state endangered bat. It's been listed for a long time. It's a cave bat in mostly in the mountains of Virginia. And it pretty much stays in the mountains. Some of our cave bats migrate in the eastern part of the state during the warm months, but this one is in the mountains all the time. Um, this is one of the species that it's been, like I said, listed as endangered for a long time, and that was due to habitat disturbance and destruction uh, of their caves in the mountains. So there's been a lot of cave protection over the years, and that was before even white nose syndrome. So we do have some other listed bats. Um, so among our federally endangered, state endangered bats, including the Virginia big-eared, we also have the gray bat, the Indiana bat, and those three are cave bats that uh, hibernate in caves in the mountains of Virginia. The Indiana bat is one that has shown to um, come into the eastern part of the state in the warmer months. And um, again, these are the ones that have been listed a long time due to cave habitat disturbance and destruction. The um, northern long-eared bat, which is federally, federally threatened and state threatened, that one was more recently listed by the, as that listing, and that one was due to um, white nose syndrome. And that's the one in the center here. The uh, northern long-eared bat is, is a bat that uh, hibernates in the caves, but it comes out to most of the rest of the state in the warmer months. And then we have um, South, the state endangered Raffineski's Eastern Big Eared Bat. It's a lot to put up. Um, that one has been listed a long time. That one's in Southeastern Virginia, and that's this one here. They are listed, they've been listed a long time due to habitat loss. Um, traditionally, um, they were more of a species that used old, big old cypress trees that were hollow for their um, cavities that they would roost in. And that's become, a, a that is something that has declined in the landscape in recent years as well. Um, they also have adapted to using a lot of old buildings, old barns and things like that. But that too is something that sometimes is threatened. A lot of times people wanna get rid of old buildings, um, but there are some, we have, in fact, the species, we have a maternal col colony that shows up every year in an old one room schoolhouse in Sussex County. And that is, uh, luckily, the private landowner works with us and protects that habitat. It's boarded up, and they, I uh, think he has extra funding for not only conservation, but also historic purposes to keep that building as is, and the bats use it all the time. There is uh, also the last two, the state endangered little brown bat and state endangered tricolored bat. These were listed more recently because of white nose syndrome. And, and that's the two down here. The little brown bat used to be our most common species. And unfortunately, white nose syndrome has taken near, it seems like it's taken about 90% of the population. 
Um, and these two do hibernate in caves, but they will use much of the rest of the state in the warmer months. Then we have species we're keeping an eye on. Um, this is on our Virginia Wildlife Action Plan. We have a list called the Virginia Species of Greatest Conservation Need. And these species are on that list. Um, the red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bats, these three here that are co pretty colorful. These are um, tree bats that, um, the reason they're on the list is because of the wind energy situations. These are the bats that tend to get killed by the blades of wind turbines. That's why they're on that list for now. The uh, Eastern small footed bat. I think that's the one that's white nose syndrome. Small footed, yes. White, the small footed bat is one that hibernates in caves and white nose syndrome is the reason we're keeping an eye on that one. The southeastern bat, which is here in the corner, that bat is mostly in southeastern Virginia um, and its habitat loss is the reason for that one. And that's similar to the habitat loss of the Raffineski bat. Um, they like bottomland hardwoods. And then when we talk about bats, I may have I've already used the words a couple of times, we've got cave bats versus tree bats. So the cave bats, as I mentioned with a lot of them, are the bats that hibernate in caves. Some of them stay mostly in caves, even when in the warmer months. The Virginia big eared bat, for example, um, uses caves in the summer, but oftentimes they go to different sites, summer versus winter. The um, some of the others, like I mentioned earlier, the Indiana bat is a cave bat, but we do see them using other parts of the state, eastern part of the state in the warmer months. And then um, the tree bats, such as our red bat and the hoary bat, these are bats that use tree cavities for hibernation. Many of them also migrate further south. Um, so some of these are the bats that sometimes will come out in a warm spell in winter. So if you have a warm evening in winter, Oftentimes I've seen the red bats for sure come out and fly. Um, they, their hibernation isn't as deep, I guess. And um, the other, some of the physical differences in them because of their different habitats um, include that with cave bats, their tail membranes tend to be naked, whereas the tails of the tree bats tend to have fur on them. And that's because to, with the tree bat, they're more exposed and that it helps um, cover them with more fur. They actually sometimes will curl up in a way that that tail kind of acts as a blanket um, to keep them warmer. Um, the other difference with them is that cave hibernators tend to hibernate in big groups, colonies. Um, they also tend to be the ones that have big maternal colonies, but they usually have only one bat, one pup, her female bat when they give birth. The tree bats tend to have twins or more. The um, red bat is one that actually has been known to have up to four pups at once. And they actually, they tend to rear their young individually, solitarily. So the importance of Virginia's bats, again, and with them, of course, our bats are mostly insectivores or they may eat small invertebrates. But so pest control is, is the big, big um, importance of Virginia's bats. So as I mentioned, of course, we like them for eating all those biting insects, mosquitoes and so forth. But, um, and of course that helps with disease spread and everything as well as our comfort. But also the plant pests, as I mentioned, some of these are of course pests of crops that are important um, and and gardens, but we also have um, beetles that bore into native trees. So they're very important for the overall ecosystem, not just our crops and our, and our mosquitoes and things. So very, very important. In fact, the agri, so I know one thing I was gonna look at. So we had, um, a lot of agriculture industry has actually looked at bats, studied bats for their um, e 
economic value for agriculture as well. Um, the estimates of pest consumption of bats is worth almost $23 billion annually in the United States. And that's, that's billions. So, um, and that's because of their, with their work, the work that bats do, it reduces the use of pesticides. It avoids the cost of crop damage. And another added benefit that's a little more indirect is that bats reduce the fungal infections of corn and which in turn reduces the negative impacts on livestock that they consume that corn. So that's another benefit beyond. So of course there's not only the monetary benefit but the environmental benefit of less pesticides and the human health of that. So very, very good to have around. And then, so we talk about the importance of them and we need to talk about the threats. And in Virginia, the biggest threats, again, are the habitat destruction, as I mentioned, with almost all wildlife, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, destruction and disturbance. And with white nose syndrome, as I mentioned earlier, so that was this, that is a fungus that causes white nose syndrome that was first detected in New York in 2006. It was first detected in Virginia about two years later. Um, and it is, again, caused by a fungus, I'll try to say the name once, um, Pseudogymnoascus destructans is the scientific name of that fungus that causes white nose syndrome. And um, it's believed that that was brought, that's a, a fungus that was known and a disease that was known in Europe, in Eurasia area, uh, that was brought to the United States. They believe people who were caving or spelunking came to the New York cave and probably had equipment that they used over yeah. Yeah. that was um, contaminated with that fungus. So unfortunately, that's probably how it was introduced here in the United States and our bats are not acclimated to it. There has been, sh there has been some improvement in studies, but um, unfortunately, it, it's been moving faster than the bats can handle it in most, some of the species anyway. Um, and then we have wind energy, as I mentioned, um, there are solutions to that to curb the threat they have on bats. So some of the things are such as studies that to stop or reduce the use of those turbines during certain times, like fall migration time um, and during low winds at night are the best times to either stop or at least reduce the turning of the turbines. Um, also the use of sound or acoustic deterrence around on or around the blades to keep them away from them. And there's also been studies looking at different colors of the blades and or the use of UV lights on or around those blades that help keep them away from them to see them and so forth. Uh, and then there's um, other designs instead of the traditional design, you often see different designs of the blades that may, um, the bats may be able to get around better. So different things like that are, are bringing some hope to still being able to use wind energy. And we'll get into now um, a little bit with the myths and health concerns. Um, some people worry about bats being rabies vectors as well as some other diseases. And then there's always the silly myths that people believe um, that bats will fly into their hair or you hear the blind as a bat saying often, um, flying into the hair, simply, no, they don't do that. Um, there may have been very unusual instances, especially in a couple, you know, two or three centuries ago in Victorian times and so forth, when people wore those big wigs <laughs> that were, and, and as well, people um, back then didn't bathe as much. And uh, here those wigs were not very clean either. So there probably were insects <laughs> around those wigs that they were going after. And they say that echolocation may not pick up um, hair as well. So that might've been one of the reasons that became a myth. Um, they also do, if you go outside at night um, and bats are around, they may fly very close to your head, but that's also, a, an, um, they're not coming after you. Basically, often people are going to have insects around them, either the mosquitoes trying to get to you, or oftentimes people, of course, are around lights. So the insects that are attracted to lights, things like moths that they eat, um, that's the reason they may fly really close to your head, but they're not after you or your hair. Um, and they are, of course, not blind. I think I already mentioned that to you, that 
they do, even our bats uh, that are, use echolocation have very small eyes, but they can see quite well with those eyes. Um, echolocation just helps with the type of prey that they go after and given that they do it at night in the woods often too. Um, rabies is something that bats really don't have that often. Um, they are not one of the species that have it the most. Um, usually it's less than 1%, maybe up to 3% of all bats that may test positive for rabies. And um, it, it's much less than something like raccoons and skunks tend to test much more commonly for rabies than bats. Um, now, with that said, you still don't wanna to touch a bat and that's true with any animal. So if you see a bat on the ground, another thing about bats, talking about rabies, is they don't tend to become aggressive like some other species might. Um, typically, if a bat's gonna have rabies, it's just gonna be sick. And so if you see a bat on, a gr on the ground, do not touch it. If it has to be moved, use thick leather gloves um, and other equipment to scoop it up and get it out of the way. Say if there's a pet around, you don't want it to be around, um, that kind of thing. If you have to move it, don't touch it with your bare hands. Use um, gloves, use a shovel to scoop it up or empty trash can, that sort of thing to move it away. Um, also, if a bat is found in the house, uh, say you wake up from sleeping and you see the bat and you're not sure if it bit you or someone else or a pet, a pet that's when you do want to um, see if you can collect the bat and get it to your local health department to test it for rabies. Now, that does mean they will ha it will have to be euthanized or if also if you find a bat that is dead in your house. Um, and especially it seems fresh. You wanna also take that to the health department to be tested for rabies, just in case anybody has been bit. Um, so it's, it's something to be concerned of, but don't be afraid that all bats have rabies. That is definitely not the case. Um, bats that are normally flying around are normally fine. It's the ones that just laying around on the ground and trying not to bother you. Those are the ones you just wanna avoid. Um, the other two, things on the list here, histoplasmosis and parasites are things that people might be concerned about if you get bats in your attic, for instance, especially if you get multiple bats, uh, maybe even a maternity colony. Um, and that's what happens. So probably about now or within the next month is about the time that that may occur if they can get into your attic. And um, the best thing really, and so the reason I'm talking about histoplasmosis is a parasite. Histoplasmosis is something that you could get from bat guano if there's a big um, pile of it, basically, if it's piling up. But if they're up in the attic and it's not getting into your house, it's not something to worry about um, for at least for that season. Because basically what you wanna do if possible is let the bats if they're already established up there, they're most likely females having babies and you won't, you won't want to exclude them until the babies are ready to fly on their own. And that's not until the end of summer. Um, so if possible, and if you have bats in the attic, see if you can keep them there as long as everything is shut off so they can't get in the house and you don't have guano getting into your living space at all, that kind of thing. So there may be exceptions to that, but most, um, professional exterminating companies are now aware that so many of our bats are listed, um, including the little brown bat is one that's, that tends to be one of those that you see as addicts and so forth. So they do, they are careful about trying not to kill the bats if possible and letting them go through their cycle. And then what they'd use, and this is the, illust the illustration here shows um, an excluder device you can make yourself with hardware cloth. So you find an opening that they're coming in and out of toward, again, this is the end of summer, the bat, baby bats can usually fly on their own by the end of August. And that's about the time you can start using an excluder device. And this is hardware cloth that's been placed over the hole and has a bit of a tunnel to the hole. So the bats can get out, but they typically don't, they won't wanna come back into all of that structure that's blocking the uh, hole. So they'll come out and make their way out, but they won't come back with these types of devices. And of course, exterm as I mentioned, exterminating companies, most of them have these devices as well, probably something more sophisticated. Um, 
and finding any hole there is that, that they're using to use this to get them out. And once they're out, then you have to make sure any openings are sealed so they can't get back in. A lot of these exterminated companies also have the service of cleaning up the guano if it is a large colony that has left quite a mess um, that you wanna get cleaned up before you mess around up there because they probably have the best way to do it. There's hazmat suits and so forth you have to have on. Um, the parasites again too are something that really is only gonna happen if you're handling the bats, which as I mentioned, do not handle a bat. Um, <laughs> that is something that the only way they would have parasites transfer from them to you. And most of the parasites on bats are very species specific that aren't interested in us. So even the ticks and things that are on bats are often not the ones that are on humans. So again, I'm just trying to make sure people know that there is some concern to have, but don't be fearful of bats. Because this is, um, th these kinds of things are very rare for any, any um, diseases to be uh, transmitted from bat to human. Okay, so now that we hopefully have settled any fears, um, another thing you can do, and especially once you get them, if you have had a problem with them getting in the attic, once you get them out and you got the attic all sealed, now you can provide a home for them. So they will go to that home instead of using your attic. And so bat houses and boxes are very good. And it's good to keep in mind all the different things um, about bat houses that will work in this area. So in Virginia, um, you wanna select or build your house based on certain things. Um, you wanna make sure the coloration of the house is dark to a medium color. So in the photo here, I believe this first photo is in the New Jersey area, but um, pretty close. And so you can see anywhere from black to a kind of medium brown is a good color. And then a dark color helps keep the house warm for the babies, because they basically what you want it for is for those warm months for the bats to roost in. And sometimes that means the females will use them and have their young in them. And so they need a, actually a warm temperature. Um, and this one here is actually in the mountains of Virginia. This is um, Rick Reynolds did this photo. He's our bat biologist. And this is in the mountains. So you see we have a black box in the mountainous part of Virginia. And um, the other thing too with the design, the bigger the better if you can, um, often up to four chambers inside is good. They, they like lots of little narrow spaces and, and scoring of the inside so they have a place to put their little claws with the way they hang upside down, um, a way to attach to those. There's also a, I've, the rocket design here on the last photo, the rocket house is another design where it's it kind of chambers all the way around. Apparently bats really go for that type of box as well. And you also notice all of these are on poles. Uh, being on a pole or a building mounted that way is really the best way and not so much on a tree. Trees can um, have branches that may shade the box too much. And also often with trees, you're gonna have a little, a, a higher risk of predators getting to the box. So things that might eat the bats. Um, or even things that might compete with them. And also, you also want to, um, placement also means you want to have the bat house at least 12 to 20 feet high off the ground. That's, that's one of their preferences. And also have it south facing. Again, south facing helps keep it warm. And as far as timing, just around this time of year is about the time to make sure you have your bat box up and ready for them to use at least now to about the next month. So those are the main issues with a bat box and which, which kind you should get and where she, you should place it and all those good things. Some other things you can do, provide suitable habitat on your property or encourage it at your community and school properties. And so always plant native plants. Again, like I mentioned, these are all native species, a lot of the, Prey, they go after our native insects, which are dependent on many of them dependent on native plants. So that's always a good thing. Keep snags when you, whenever possible. Snag, of course, is a dead tree. So if, if you have a wooded lot or a wooded area of your property um, with a dead tree within it, where 
you can leave it alone. It, that would be great because it's great habitat for bats as, as well as other things, cavity nesters. Um, of course, I understand, I say when possible. So if you have a snag next to your house, you may not want it there. You don't want something that's gonna fall on your house or across your driveway, that sort of thing. But if, like I said, if you have an area where you can keep them, keep them for the wildlife. Um, provide a water source if needed. So if you don't have a, a pond or stream nearby, you may have a water source like you do for birds, a bird bath or um, garden pond, that sort of thing. Educate the public about bats, including their beneficial roles that we've talked about. Um, other things you can do um, for conservation funding. We have our Restore the Wild membership now through our department at our website, Restore the Wild. Um, or, and or you can donate to the non-game fund, which um, is funding that goes towards all of our, of course, non-game species such as bats. So forest habitat in Prince William area, I did want to discuss, we've got four listed species that are, are known or likely within the area of Prince William. All of them are cave bats and um, they use the forest during summer, uh, warmer months. All of these do. Three that are really known and likely for Prince William are the um, the newly listed bats, the northern long-eared, the little brown bat, and the tricolored bat. These species, uh, like I said, are cave bats, and caves are where that fungus grows because the, um, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, the fungus grows in temperatures that stay under 70 degrees at all times. So that's why caves are such good habitats, unfortunately, for the fungus. And that's where it gets on the bats during hibernation. And that once white nose syndrome starts, <clears throat> it makes them weak. It makes them come out of hibernation looking for food and using up energy. And um, a lot of times, unfortunately, they end up dying trying to feed when they're supposed to hibernate and store their energy. <clears throat> So making sure you have that forest habitat because they'll roost in trees in the warmer months. And so it's very important to have the forest habitat for these bats in the eastern part of the state for the warm months. And then the Indiana bat is the one that I included here because we have them in recent years, they've been documented at Fort AP Hill, just south as the bat flies um, from Prince William. And um, so there's always a possibility there are tree roosts they're using in the Prince William area. So that's why I wanted to include that. Um, like I said, this it's kind of in recent years, we're finding more and more of them using areas in the Eastern part of the state, this um, species that's been endangered for a long time. So a little bit more about bats of Prince William County, the something a little more common, the Eastern red bat is one that's found across the state during the different times of year. Um, as you can see on the distribution map here, red bats are, as we saw earlier on that species of greatest conservation need list so as, as a tier four species. Um, they roost in trees year round. Um, the females raise the young in dense foliage of the tree branches. They hibernate in the tree cavities. And sometimes they'll even hibernate under logs or rocks. So they may hibernate near the ground. Um, that, but they do also, as I mentioned, they will migrate south during, those, um, during the colder months. They feed around lights and they mostly eat moths and beetles, but also June bugs, plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, and ants. And they are, um, a fairly good size bat. They're about four to four and a half inches in length from head to tail. Um, they're about half an ounce in weight. But one of the interesting things about the red bat too, again, this is our one of our tree bats. So it has a lot of fur. <laughs> and the, but one interesting thing about the red bat is this actually a dimorphic species. So the males and females are slightly different in appearance. The males are a, kind of a bright red, Irish setter red. Whereas the females tend to have a, a white frosted, um, duller red coloration. They both have a white patch of fur at the shoulders and wrists. And they typically, they breed late summer and they breed in flight apparently. They also have delayed fertilization. So the pups are not born until the spring. And again, these are, this is the one that um, the females may have 
up to four pups. The big brown bat is probably our most common bat in the Commonwealth now, um, although they even are being watched for certain things that may threaten them. But the big brown bat is um, throughout Virginia and they actually do uh, hibernate in caves, but they tend to be solitary. They're, these are one of the ones that are a little bit of an exception to some of the rules. And, um, but they will also use man-made structures to hibernate and roost. Um, they will hibernate um, again in caves, but also man-made structures. They summer also in barns and old buildings and sheds. Um, the females will form maternity colonies under loose bark or, or in man-made structures, and they emerge before dusk to feed. They'll eat up to a third of their body weight in one night. And they're known to eat a lot of agricultural pests. They're about four to five inches in length, and their weight is about a half to three quarters of an ounce. And they have looked at maternity colonies and old structures that may have hundreds of females and some males where the females tend to be up higher in warmer parts of the um, structure and the males stay more solitary in the lower areas. Then we've got the hoary bat, it's, uh, one of our other colorful bats. Um, this is one of those list, the species on our species of greatest conservation need is a tier four. Um, again, a tree bat, and they roost in the trees year round, similar to the red bat. They like coniferous forests near clearings, and they will also migrate further south from in the fall from north to south. Um, they uh, have a diet that is mostly moths, they also will eat stink bugs and wasps, leaf and gene bugs, dragonflies, grasshoppers, and flies. And they sometimes even attack smaller bats, such as the tricolored bat. Um, this is one of our big bats. This is a large bat for Virginia. It's five to six inches and can weigh three quarters to one and a half ounces. And the coloration of the fur gives it its name, the hoary coloration. Um, the fur, the, the if you were to, which you're not supposed to touch them, but if you were to touch them, the base of the fur is black and then tan and then dark brown and then tipped with white. So it has this very frosty coloration with all these different colors. And then it has patches of white on the shoulders and wrists and the throat and wing and around the head is a buffy coloration. And they mate in late summer, similar to the red bat. They also can have up to four pups. Here's the silver-haired bat. This is another tree bat. This one too is another one of those tier four species like the hoary bat and the red bat. Um, tree bat that uses cavities or sloughing bark, um, rock crevices sometimes to roost, usually solitary, but sometimes may have small maternity colonies. Um, they, this is a bat of waterways, so they often fly along riparian habitats. They're slow, but highly maneuverable, um, kind of an opportunistic feeder. And of the study, there's not a whole lot of study on their diet, but of the studies that have been done, they know that they will eat moths, hoppers, longhorn bugs, beetles, and flies. Uh, most migration records, most of the records in Virginia are during migration time, but we do have a few recent ones showing that they're breeding in Virginia but most of the females raise the young even further north than Virginia. Um, they have the dark brown hairs tipped with the white or silver hair. Um, and so that is what gives them their name. They're about three to 3.6 to four inches and weigh about a third to just less than a half an ounce. And again, they mate in late summer. And then we have the evening bat. This is a, this is one that has very few studies on it as far as what it feeds on. They, sh they show that they eat beetles and moths and leaf hoppers, at least. Um, they, this species is more of a coastal plain and into the Piedmont. And there's a couple records in the mountains. Um, but uh, this is, again, more of a eastern species. And it's described as a scaled down big brown bat <laughs> as far as its appearance. 
Um, it's about three to 3.8 inches and weighs about a quarter to a half ounce. Unlike other tree bats, they don't have the fur on the tail. And that might be because it's more of an Eastern, Southeastern species. They also have an acrid odor, apparently, because when they have their young, they actually rub the scent from a man, submandibular gland, which is below the lower jaw on the face of the young and helps them recognize their young. And they usually have two young. And this is our one of our listed species. The tricolored bat is a state endangered species um, cave bat that lives um, you know, uses the caves to hibernate, but lives across the state in the warmer months. And unfortunately, again, this is a state endangered one in recent years because of white nose syndrome. It's mostly solitary, and it's one of the first bats usually to emerge in the early evening when they feed, and they'll feed at treetop level. They eat small flies, beetles, true bugs, and flying ants. Um, they are Let's see, they're one of our smallest bats. They're only two, 2.8 to three and a half inches on average and weigh only about a tenth to maybe a third of an ounce. And their fur is tricolored. Again, this is only something you could see if you could actually handle it. Um, the base of the fur is dark and the middle of it is white and the, and the ends of the fur, the tips of the fur are reddish brown. So you mostly see the reddish brown coloration when you see them. Um, maybe a little bit of white showing through as well. Um, the forearm is usually pinkish, as you can see in the photo here, pinkish or reddish in coloration. Um, and during hibernation, this is a bat that has considerable uh, condensation on the body. So oftentimes if you, if you see a photo of them hibernating, there's often lots of little droplets on their fur, droplets of condensation. And they typically have um, twins. So they're, for a cave bat, they have an exception to the rule where they typically have twins instead of one. This is our federally threatened, state threatened, northern long-eared bat. And again, one of those cave bats um, that hibernates in the caves in the winter in the mountains, but spends summer months all across Virginia. Um, they may use, also may use mines or dams instead of caves and they like tight spaces, typically. They are um, unique at feeding and what we call gleaning. So um, what they do is they actually snatch food from leaves and twigs and even the ground. Um, their diet consists of moths, flies, beetles, caedus flies, and spiders. So they have kind of an interesting um, food habit. They're similar in appearance to the little brown bat, except for those ears, a little bit bigger ears. They're about three to three and a half inches and about, about a quarter of an ounce or a little more, about a quarter to a third. They actually mate in fall, um, and, but they do have delayed fertilization and only have one pup, so as a typical cave bat. And they have small maternity colonies, usually less than 100 females. Um, the maternity sites are under exfoliating bark in, and also in buildings or under bridges. And another interesting behavior is the males and females will swarm at cave entrances in August and September. And so this is our last one that we might see in Prince William County, the little brown bat, our state, state endangered one that I mentioned earlier, unfortunately is um, used to be one our most common species and it's now become much more, um, uh, much less common. And uh, this is again a cave bat, hibernates in the caves, and but it uses most of the state. It doesn't quite like the very southeastern tip, the Virginia Beach area, but most of the rest of the state in all the warmer months. Um, the females do form maternity colonies and the males stay solitary in the summer. Um, midges are a staple of their diet, but they also like tiny flies, moths, mosquitoes, and beetles. So I hate to see this one um, go down in population when they like to eat mosquitoes and midges. Um, throughout Virginia, except the Southeast, I already mentioned that, um, they're about 3.2 to 3.8 inches and weigh about a quarter to a little under half an ounce. The wingspan of this one is about 8.7 to 10.7 inches. They have large feet that are heavily furred. Their toes are furred. Um, 
their back fur is dark brown and much lighter on the underside. So gray to white typically on the underside. Um, and this is a um, one of the interesting studies on their diet is shows that after giving birth, the females prefer larger prey such as beetles and they often feed over water. So a lot of our bats um, do like to feed over water or near water. Of course, that, a lot of times that's an area that attracts a lot of insects. So for more information on bats, we, I wanted to give you some other resources to, to continue learning about them. Um, we have our resource that I work on, the Virginia Fish and Wildlife Information Service. Um, it's our online wildlife data and mapping service. So we have a link on our website, but this is the direct link here that I've listed. Um, also, we have different pages on our website referring to our um, guide, which I'll show you in a minute, the guide to the Bats of Virginia. Um, has uh, a whole section on the website under mammals, uh, all, all of our different bat information. And then another great resource for bats all, on, all over the world is Bat Conservation International. Batcon.org is a wonderful site that has all the information you need about bat boxes and houses, um, when, when, what to do when you get those bats in the house and that sort of thing. Um, information about bats all over the world and studies being done. So lots of good information there always. And then of course we've got, as I mentioned, our guide to the bats of Virginia. Um, that's available at shopdwr.com. And anything this and anything else you get at that website, the proceeds benefit the Virginia Wildlife Grant Program, which connects youth to the outdoors. And then also check out our Facebook page, um, DWR's Facebook page. This is photos from Bat Week. Um, that's usually the last week of October. Um, Bat Week is always featured around Halloween. So um, these are some of the photos. Unfortunately, we also feature information on white nose syndrome during that week, uh, as you can see in the center photo. And that's everything I can think of at the moment, but if I'm Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Susan. You're welcome. I thought that was so uh, <laughs> that's so neat to think that you know tree tree bats have a built-in blanket. Yeah, <laughs> that's really fun. Um, there we go. All right, so um, I'll open it up for questions. If anyone. Uh, has any questions or would like to share a bat story with the group? <laughs> oh, let's see, we have a few. Amy, do you wanna um, unmute yourself, unmute yourself and, um, and ask your question? Yes, how, how does a bat spread a mango seed when they're really large? <laughs> well, that's, that's one of those bigger bats that will eat seeds. That's typically gonna be the fruit eaters um, that are gonna eat seeds like that. So that's the, like, the big flying fox we saw the picture of. Um, it's gonna be something like that. And that's how they're able to. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I have a question. Oh, Lisa, let me. Are there any places in Prince William County that are especially important to bats? You know, um, Prince William Forest Park. Yeah, like I like I mentioned, forest habitat is, is definitely important. So I would imagine William, um, the National Forest Park, is 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 a major one. Like I said, the we've got Fort AP Hill not far down south from there. That's a that's a big forested habitat. So I would imagine, that's why I wanted to include the one species um, with Prince William, because I think there is definitely potential for a place like that to have them. Thank you. You're welcome. Issa, do you wanna pop in? Yeah, we um, lived in um, Senegal in West Africa, and we used to have the privilege of having rather large fruit bats come and feed off the trees. We had a latex-like fruit that they just loved. Mm -hmm. And we had video of them climbing over with babies on their tummies, climbing over the branches. And yeah. the coolest that little um, toe that sticks up is actually helps them grab the, the branches as they walk along. That's really, really neat. I, I don't know a whole lot about these 
different bats from around the world that do that eat fruit and so forth. Um, I don't have <laughs> any experience with those, but I've learned about them as much as I can. And that would be a really neat experience. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, we've lived here about 25 years. And when we first moved here, we had a lot of bats that we'd see at night, but we haven't seen any now for quite a while. So how can you attract bats? Um, well, like I said, the, the, um, the bat houses are one way, give them something to use to roost in. Um, but also, as I mentioned too, even planting native plants can eventually help attract bats because it'll probably attract their prey that they're after. Um, so anything, any, anything you can do and, and encourage uh, more forest habitat that they would use to roost in. So like I said, a lot of these cave bats use forest habitat in the summertime to roost. Um, so not only just the tree bats, but them too, will use trees to roost in, um, whether it's cavities or under just under foliage or sloughing bark and that sort of thing. So there's, and like I said too, um, water source is another thing you can provide. As I mentioned, bats a lot of, a lot of times feed over water. Um, a lot of times that's an area that attracts insects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any, with the white nose syndrome, is there, um, are we, is there any research being done? Because it seems, that seems to be really devastating populations. Yeah. Is there much advancement in terms of protecting bats from that specifically? Yes, there's, there's a few different things. Um, first, there's uh, some of the species, I think the big brown bat is one that seems to be a little more resilient to it than others. Um, so they look at species like that to see if there's anything they can get gleaned from them to help the others. Um, there's also been um, certain substances found to help fight the fungus. Um, the only issue with that, and, and they found different ways to maybe treat caves and so forth in a way not to disturb the bats and hopefully kill the fungus. Um, so the, at different bacteria and things that they've um, studied, there's, there's a been a, a few things going on with that to try to help them. Um, so there's, there's been a little bit of hope here and there, but like I said, unfortunately, the, the fungus has moved really fast. Um, like I said, it's, it's all across the United States now. There's um, um, records now in Washington state, as well as California, and a lot of places in between um, Texas and Minnesota and different areas. So unfortunately, um, there is, some, there seems to be some resilience too. And like for some reason, Florida hasn't had any records of it. So I don't, maybe it's just too hot and humid there. Um, again, it's the fungus thrives in, a, it needs a habitat that stays under 70 degrees at all times. So that's why caves is where they, um, it's the cave bats that get affected by the um, white nose syndrome. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Barbara, it looks like you have your hand up. Why don't you unmute and come on in? Yes, I was wondering when you said a water source um, for bats, because we have a bat house and we do, I live in the mountains in near Front Royal, in a timber home. And they actually, we actually have them hang out underneath our back deck that's covered because it's wood and they just love to hang out there once in a while. But what kind of water source can I put out to um, help any bats that use my bat house? Um, even just a bird bath is, is enough to give them something. Um, but if you could do like a little garden pond is always good. Um, or even just it, other little sources like you might put out for birds. Um, okay. Okay. okay, thanks. That's great. You're welcome. Janice, do you want to come in and ask your question? Yeah, I live in a town home community and I was wondering I get bats to fly through here every time from like March through October I was wondering if there's any way to identify them by their calls uh, I've got a uh, bat device that will allow me to hear the chirps but I can't identify what types of bats they are okay I'm I'm vaguely familiar with that I know that some a lot of researchers are using that technology now um, to identify bats and um, our bat biologist is a little skeptical of it, so we don't use those records at this moment on our on our website. But um, because some it, there's some species you can tell 
very well and apparently, but some that may be easily confused with others. So it depends on the species. Um, that's something I'd have to ask my colleague, Rick Reynolds, about a little bit more detail. Um, like I said, I, I just know that um, it works really well with some species apparently and maybe in some areas, but then there's other species that maybe sound too similar to tell apart. Thanks, Janice. Gary, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, actually, I got a picture of a bat. If I can, I don't know if I can share the screen or not. Uh, I think you should be able to, yeah. Um, if uh, you go uh, to the bottom oh, okay, and you do share okay. screen. Do, 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 do. Oh, how about that? Can you see that? Yes. <laughs> that... Can you see it? Yes, mm -hmm. it looks like a red bat. Red bat, yeah. Yeah, probably maybe female because it looks maybe not quite so red, but yeah. Yeah, I had that. Uh, uh, we we were doing a uh, a woodcock walk. Oh. And and it, I did hear the woodcock in the uh, in the fields, but it, this might not have been the same day because it was there for like two or three days. But I did see the the bats flying around at the same time, and this was uh, early early in March. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I, I know the red bat is one that will come out pretty easily in a, in a warm spell. So, um, yeah, that that's a really cool picture. Thank you. I, I, I also took one, and I told people when it was flying around, it looked like uh, the Batman signal. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, Gary. Thanks so much for sharing. What a great shot. It seems like that would be hard to see. <laughs> well, it, it was in a pine tree. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm eye to eye with, with it, you know. Wow. Be surprised what's out there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Not to mention I that Gary has one of the best spotting <laughs> eyes in Northern Virginia. He's everything. That's helpful. Uh, I, was at, I was at Merrimack today and had some good dragonflies. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. That's great. Any other questions or um, stories about bats? Well, I can say my kids live um, in in Florida, in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was the town put up a huge amount of bat houses and it's a tourist attraction. Oh, wow. Oh yeah, it's so cool. You just go right at dusk and wait yeah. with all the people and thousands and thousands of bats fly out right over you. It is oh, really wow. something. That's really neat. Yeah. I've, I've, now that you mentioned that, I've heard of that, not only um, for tourist attraction, but also, um, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. the agriculture industry looking at bats. Um, mm -hmm. Some places are putting up these huge bat houses around fields and, or certain crops. Um, in fact, when I, sh when I mentioned Bacardi with the bat symbol, they have constructed, apparently that facility has constructed a lot of big bat houses because, I, like I said, they have a benefit. I can't remember if they pollinate or seed the um, sugar cane or, or maybe it's pest control, but they help with the sugar cane protection. <laughs> yep. Very cool. One, one, of the, one of the caves uh, in Virginia that you can go in, you can see the bats in uh -huh. really close. I, I won't say which one, <laughs> but at least I'm used to. I don't know if they're still there or not. Yeah, I've, I've been in one of those too. And um, yeah, I don't know what's going Well, so one thing that has been affected this past year with COVID-19, um, because it's potentially a disease we could pass back and forth with bats, um, a lot of our researchers have had to delay a lot of research with bats as far as handling them um, or going into those caves in some cases. Um, so they're using a lot, like, like um, the question that came up about um, IDing them by their call, a lot more of that's been used this past year using the acoustic data as best they can. And, and that's getting better and better, of course. Um, like I said, there's still some species, I think, that are hard to tell apart. But um, yeah, it's been a lot of bat research has been delayed this past year because of the virus, unfortunately. Huh. All right. I have one more question. This is Barb. Yep. Go um, for it. 
one time, more than <laughs> once in my life, I have found a bat laying down. One of them looked like it flew into a glass window and one was down in a cave that had, we think children had knocked it down off of a little group that was hanging out in the roof. And what we did is we got a towel or gloves, whatever we had, picked it up and held it up until it clung to the ceiling and then continued. Is that something we shouldn't have done or? Is... No, that's, that's probably good. Like I said, um, if you do see a bat on the ground and, and it needs to be moved, like I said, if there's pets around or something, um, that is one thing that's recommended. As long as you use, like you said, precautions, gloves or towel, anything so you don't touch it itself and put it up in the crotch of a tree or, or high bushes somewhere away from the ground so that hopefully they can um, take off. That's because sometimes when they end up on the ground too, it's just awkward for them to take off. They need, a lot of them prefer to fly off from a higher perch. Um, so it, it, it was helpful. At, like I said, at least to get it out of the way, if, if especially if kids are still around, you don't want them handling it anymore either, so. Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. Anything else for tonight with bats? Well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan. I learned a ton and I know everyone else here has too. Um, and uh, to everyone, just a quick uh, plug. We did just launch a photo contest. Gary, you reminded me when you shared your, your fabulous photo. Um, so for all you photographers out there, um, grab your cameras and, and uh, share what you see in, uh, in nature with us. Um, details you can find on our website. And of course we have a, an event next Monday also. So hope to see you there. Um, thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Enjoy it. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Good night. Hey, Kim. Hey, Gary. Hey, you know, I, I would kind of like, <laughs> I don't like cutting, but some, some of the fields that we used to go in uh, uh, at, at Merrimack, why, why aren't they cutting them, you know, like they used to? They you have know, a new, they have a new person. Yeah, but I'm, you know, like the Which ones, fields are you talking about? Well, it's you know it's right past the barns, you know where we used to have the uh, uh, the hair streaks and stuff. The one like you had on your glasses that one. Yeah. Time. That some of those fields right there are you know they they're huge, you know. So you only got the pathway to go. I know, and the one behind the wildlife garden needs to be mowed too. I'll yeah. say something tomorrow. I, I I know you know I always complain about like cut it at the wrong time or whatever, which which I don't even know. If, you know, it's the wrong time or not, but uh, I mean, yeah, I had uh, good dragonflies today. I still haven't seen ones like we've had before, but uh, I had the springtime darner and uh, uh, oh, the twins. I don't know if you've seen my, my picture or not, but the twin twin spike tail. Uh -huh. I, I had I had I had it on my thumb with the camera up here, uh -huh. and, and and Matthew had to adjust the focus for me. <laughs> Oh, that's a cool. brilliant shot. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah, and I went and I went to uh, uh, Prince William Forest Park today and had a uh, uh, a hooded a hooded warbler, which I oh cool. Could, I couldn't get a picture of it. It was too fast. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Oh yeah. Great uh, sight though. Yeah, I I go out all the time. <laughs> uh, well, y'all say true. You. You have the best eye in Northern Virginia. I gotta get, I gotta get I, somehow. I gotta get some tickets for the for the rain barrel. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's extra beautiful this year, and it's painted on both sides too. 
Ashley, we we are uh, you're on Facebook, right? Yeah. Yes. So intermittently. We we aren't friends, are we? Maybe I should. I think we're friends. I look at your pictures. No, no, no. I'm talking about Ashley. Oh. Um, I don't know if probably, we are, probably. but uh, <laughs> I, I'm. I don't know if you want to see all my pictures that I put on there. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> They're fabulous. It's it's so good what's out there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and you put them up on Flickr too. Yeah, not at, oh gosh, I'm so far behind. <laughs> I hear you, you and Judy. Well, you better be entering the photo contest for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, the one with the uh, last year, I thought it was a, a, a black snake or something. It was, you know, going from the pond back to the north parking area. Oh yeah. And I thought it was, was a, a black snake and uh, it turned out to, to be the black, I reckon it was, I don't know what kind of version we call it, but it was a hog nose snake. Matter of fact, it's on the, it's on that, uh, the, the photo thing. Oh, yeah, it's cool. on the Flickr page. Yeah, yeah, on the Flickr one. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks. Oh, gosh, it's so, this is terrible. I mean, during the winter, you don't have a whole lot to take a picture of now. It's, it's. Yeah, you know, it's everywhere you turn. Which is good. Uh, I'm not complaining. <laughs> Where I'm, where I'm going to go tomorrow. I think I did 4.4 miles today. Wow. While I've been doing no less than three miles. I'll tell you, a good spot to go that I've really enjoyed is, uh, and, and if you like flowers, the Rippon Landing historic site. Oh my gosh. The, uh, did you see the, the two uh, uh, ETBs that I had? I did. That, that's where I took it. I was down on their level, <laughs> but that, that, oh, it's, it's, it's a nice place to go. I, I, I enjoy going up there and it, usually you have it all by yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's nice. Uh, Amazing. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, well, I'll let y'all go and uh, yeah, I could talk to you to death. <laughs> well, well, let's get together soon outside. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been going out all along. I know Judy, Judy's a little bit, she's getting a little bit better now, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I've had my shots over two months now, you know, and oh, great. Uh, yeah. Have you got yours, Ashley? Um, I need, I it will be getting my second dose on Monday, so I'm getting close. Did you get Pfizer or Moderna? I did, did. I got Pfizer. Pfizer, yeah. Yeah, that's what I had, and, and most people I've heard haven't had any reaction to that, but uh, like my sister, she had the Moderna. And she got sick for a day or two, but you know, yeah. I reckon all of it's good though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. fingers crossed. <laughs> See you soon. Oh, oh, hey, uh, Kim. Yeah. It's a matter of days now. Oh, you know, for Matthew? Yeah, for Millie. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> he just said he, it, it's due on the uh, 2nd of May. Mm -hmm. And he says, he says, I hope it's two days late. You know why? Star Wars, May 4th. Oh my May God. <laughs> May the very fourth Matthew. be with her. <laughs> and, well, you and, keep us posted, Gary. That's oh, yeah. really exciting. And and I didn't think of it in time, but I should have told him. I said, well, maybe maybe three days late. Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but they said mm -hmm. that she wouldn't go, let her go past her due date, which was the second. And I don't understand you know, that. But, huh. Yeah. I don't understand that either. Oh, but. Gosh, man, we're, yeah, like I said, we're all excited. Mm -mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to think of Matthew as a father, though. I know. He, he'll, he'll be 40 this year. Isn't Can that something? That? I mean, time just flies. You think I'll take any pictures? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love the little hands and the little feet. It's just so cool. Well, y'all have a good evening and uh, hope to see y'all soon. You bet. Okay. Bye, bye bye, everybody. Bye, Kim. See you tomorrow. You bet. Bye. Thanks.